All right, amen. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, it's great to be here at Stronghold Baptist Church Camp. And thank you, uh, Pastor Burzens and Miss Leslie for everything and all the Stronghold family. And uh, we just appreciate the hospitality. It's been great. We've had a want of nothing. And so the food's been great. The fellowship's been great. The preaching's been great. And so i uh, very excited to be here. And it's just been a great time of refreshing with my wife, my lovely wife here, Miss Sherry, and some friends. Uh, a lot of friends here. So very thankful. Thank you very much again for all the hospitality. Now we're in uh, Exodus chapter number 14. <clears throat> and the title of the sermon tonight is, Which Camp Do You Want to Be In? Which Camp do you want to be in? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this uh, great camp, Lord. I pray that, uh, uh, Lord, that you'd fill me with your spirit, Lord, and power and boldness and help me to get across the message you put on my heart tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So Egypt in the scriptures pictures, uh, it, it pictures the world and it pictures sin. And most, pe most preachers will tell you that. And so when the children of Israel will, were let free by, you know, finally Pharaoh let them go, uh, you know, Egypt had to be destroyed basically by God in order for him to let him go. And so, but that pictures, you know, a salvation when the children of Israel left, that, 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 that they were freed from that bondage, from the world and from sin. And the children of Israel went forth to go and serve the Lord. Now, obviously it wasn't going to be that easy because Pharaoh and his men pursued after them. But, uh, you know, obviously that pictures, you know, the pictures of them trying to go to the promised land pictures us going to heaven and all that. But uh, there's two different kind of camps that you saw if you were reading along in the scriptures. And you had the camp of the Egyptians and you have the camp of the, of the children of Israel. Now, of course, the children of Israel represent, you know, the, the, the saved people of God here. And so what I wanted to ask tonight is what camp would you want to be in? And so as we go through, you'll understand kind of where I'm coming from. But there's two different camps. And sometimes Christians, they want to go back to the world. They want to go back to the camp that they used to be in because they forget what it's like to be in that, that other camp. They forget why they wanted to be free in the first place. And as you saw in the scriptures, the children of Israel, some of the children of Israel started to ask, well, why, why did you even take us out here, Moses? And so sometimes the, the people of God, they, they begin to forget what it's like and they and they and they wax wanton against Christ and you know we shouldn't be that way we should always want to be the camp of the Lord we should always be striving to go forward and to want to work and serve the Lord and not go back to the bondage of sin so there's two camps which one do you want to be in tonight and in a crowd this size there's probably going to be people that end up leaving and going back to the world and it is possible to be saved and get backslidden, and that's something that we don't want to do. And we need to keep our focus on God and not our focus on the world. See, the, the more you dabble with the things of the world, the more your flesh is going to want to be drawn back to go back to those things, and that's not something that we want to do. So I got a few statements for you tonight. Um, statement number one is, when you get saved, the world wants you back. Statement number one, when, when you get saved, the world wants you back. Now look at verse number one in our text. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pehi Horeth, uh, between Migdal and the sea, over against uh, Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Now, obviously, also in the scriptures, the sea can represent the world. And I would just say this, that God wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. So that's very clear in the scriptures. <clears throat> but excuse me. Look at verse number uh, three. It says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. So Pharaoh says, the Bible says that Pharaoh will say this of the children of Israel. And so the world, look, when you get saved, the world wants you back. You know, your, your family members, they want you back. They, they see that you're saved and that you want to serve God. And you know what they try to do? They try to come back for you. And they try anything they can to get you back. Your, your worldly friends, your old drinking buddies, or whatever it is. I know, obviously, we have a group of mixed people here. We have children. And you know what? This message is for children, too. 
This message is for children too, because hey, even if your parents stop serving the Lord, let me tell you something, you have to make a decision to be saved in your own heart too. You can't just count on mommy and daddy to be uh, your, you know, obviously they're supposed to lead you, but if your parents ever just say, I don't want to serve God anymore, you know what? You can still serve the Lord anyway. So listen up, kids, because it's important. You have to have your own walk in the Lord, and you can't just depend on other people to walk it for you for the rest of your life. But anyway, the, so Pharaoh says they're going to be entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. See, Pharaoh realizes he lost his, his army of people that actually did all the work for them. And he's upset. You know, his, his firstborn son has died because he refused to listen to the Lord. And, you know, Egypt is destroyed. And so, like I said, it's a picture of the world wanting them back when Pharaoh begins to pursue after them. In Galatians 5.1 it says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not, what? Entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, Pharaoh said they're going to be entangled in the land. And I think it's very interesting that Galatians 5.1 uses that language where it says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, re Egypt represented the bondage and that yoke. And we want to, we're supposed to, once we get saved, we're free. We're free to serve the Lord. We're free, whereas before we were not able to serve the Lord because we were not saved and we were not free from sin. So we're not supposed to be entangled again. Now turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. We will be turning to a lot of scripture tonight, Amen. and uh, my, my goal tonight is to have someone fall over and go to sleep. No, I'm just kidding. It's not, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to rise you from the dead if you fall, you know, and break your neck or whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, so look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. It says, for after they have escaped the pollutions of, of what? The world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, what's it say there? They are again entangled therein. See, the Pharaoh, he said, hey, they're entangled in the land. And that's what he was expecting. He, you know, our, our, uh, the world wants to catch back up with us and entangle us again in the yoke of bondage. They want, you know, your, your unsafe family members, they want you back. Your unsafe friends, they want you back. Your co-workers want you to be the same old co-worker you've always been. Your friends at school want you to be the, you know, if you go to school, if you're homeschooled, then your siblings, no, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they want you to be entangled again, and the world wants you back. So it says uh, you're again entangled therein and overcome the latter and is worse with them than the beginning. So we don't want to go back to Egypt. We don't want to go back to the world once we've been saved. We want to continue to serve the Lord Jesus Christ for all the days of our lives. Now let's go back to our text. In verse 21, it says, so you're going to want to keep a finger or a ribbon or a bookmark or something like that in Exodus chapter 14. Actually, I, I, I'm sorry. Stay in 2 Peter chapter 2.20. I, I meant to read the, the second verse there. I apologize. We're not on verse 21 yet. I just realized that. So look at uh, verse 21 in 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, for it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Sorry, I'm messing with new technology here. It's kind of messing with me. I, I, I'm good. All right, so uh, verse 22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. See, our flesh does want us to go back to Egypt. Our flesh wants us to go back into the sin and, and, the, and the worldly things that we were involved with before. And if, if you do that, it's po it is possible to go back that, to that life. But it's not going to be the same. It's going to be worse for you if you go back. And you don't want to be cha chastised by the Lord. See, a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm saved. I got my, my uh, you know, get out of jail free card and all that. But see, God, as a, as a good father, is going to punish his children when they get out of line. And, he, you know, God has no, you know, God does not want us to go back to the things of the world. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 14. The, see, the world's going to want you back. And the Bible even explains this. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 14. 
Luke chapter 8, verse 14 says, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. See, Pharaoh is saying they're going to get entangled again in the wilderness. They're going to fall among these thorns, right? And that's what happens to new believers. If they don't get out of the world and get separated, then they're going to fall and get choked with the cares and riches and, and pleasure of this life and want to go back to that bondage. And so the world does want you back. Your, your old sin life in Egypt wants you back, but we need to move forward and, and serve Christ. Statement number two, when you get saved, the world will turn against you. The world will, tur will turn against you. Those you love, those you don't love, friends, families, and, and again, coworkers, they'll turn against you. See, once they can't get you back, they're going to try everything to get you back. But once they can't do that, then what are they going to do? They're going to turn against you because the world loves their own. And so, you know, God's people are supposed to love each other and, and they're supposed to love sinners also. But look, when the people realize that you're not going to come back uh, to the world, then they're going to turn against you and try to fight against you. So uh, look at verse number five in our text. It says, And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. So he, he, he's gearing up to go and, and get them back, and now he's turned against them. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So the flesh and the old man wants to make war against the spiritual, the new man. So we have a flesh and a sin nature still within us, even though we're saved, and that flesh and old man wants to war against the spiritual new man. The world loves its own, and once they discover that you're not with them, they will turn against you, and they will hate you. And so we can't be worried about who hates us and who doesn't. You know, what's most important is that we serve the God that's, that saved us, and that's the most important thing. We can't worry about... Uh, division. See, people say, well, J Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, which he is. But he also is a God of war, isn't he? And he's a man of war, the Bible says. But turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. See, the flesh and the old man, they want to go against the spiritual new man. And in this life, people are going to turn against us. The ones that we love the most will turn against us. Why? Because there's a division that happens once you get saved, a division that's supposed to happen. And if you uh, look at Matthew ch chapter 10, verse 32, it says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Amen. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So the Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus says, I'm not, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Amen. When you get saved... And, and, and you're trying to get other people saved in your family and things like that. Once, you know, they, they don't want to get saved or whatever. They don't, want to, they don't want what you want. They want to bring you back to the fold. But then once they can't do that, then they just turn against you. And want nothing to do with you and say you're in a cult, right? Baptists are, are somehow in a cult, every, every Baptist, because we believe the Bible. See, everybody wants to follow these religious systems. And those systems are okay. You know, being a Muslim is okay, according to the news, right? And, you know, all these, you know, people just love the peaceful Buddhists and all this stuff. And they're okay with those things. But once it becomes about Jesus Christ, people change. And your own dear sweet mother can turn her back on you. Your own dad could turn his back against you because of Christ. And that's why it says that he came not to send peace on earth. He came not to send peace, but a sword. 
And we have to understand that there is a division that must take place. Look what it says in verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. See, the father or mother that hates God or that doesn't love your Lord, if you love them more than you love Christ, then you're not worthy of them. Isn't that what the Bible says? It's not mints and words here. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So, you know that term where people say get a, you need to get a life? Well, you know, if you lose your life, then you're actually going to get your life, according to, to God. So you lose that old life, that old, man, that old sin life that you used to, to be in, you want to serve Christ. Well, you're going to gain a real life. Because really, our life is about serving God, isn't it, as a Christian? And so, but a lot of people will take, you know, where their parents are mad because they got saved or their, their brother or sister is mad because they want to have, you know, your family wants to have lots of children. And people just get weird and want to, like, mic micromanage your life or they want to get a hold of your kid's ear and try to tell them, that, hey, I know your parents are loony, but just wait until they're 18 or whatever. You know, you got all kinds of stuff like this. And look, you got to cut people like that out of your life. Christ said we have to make a division. And look, do you, love, do you love your parents more than you love Christ? Because if so, you're not worthy of them. That's what the Bible says. That's what it teaches. Look at, back at Exodus chapter 14, verse 6. It says, And he made ready his chariot, and he took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over every one of them. So what did Pharaoh do? Well, he got ready his army, but he took... 600 chosen chariots and then he made captains over all of them so let me tell you this when you get saved and you start to follow christ then the devil is going to send his best after you he's going to try to get you to go back to egypt you know god warns the children of israel not to go back to egypt why because that represents going back to the world going back to their life of sin going back into bondage and so the devil's going to send his chosen captains against you. He's going to try to send, you know, and he knows what your flesh likes. He knows what your pitfalls in life are. And if you won't forsake your old life and stand steadfast, he's going to win. So you have to crucify the flesh and say, you know what? I know, I know what I need to do. I need to follow Christ. I need to forsake that old path. And I need to go and forward and serve Christ. Because the devil is going to send his best against you. He's going to send your queer cousin and say, well, what, do you don't believe that, that homosexuals can be saved? Hey, look, that's a person you don't want in your life. What's more important, the Savior that loved you or your queer Siamese twin? You know, <laughs> you got to make divisions in your life. And look, those are types of people that you do not want around your children. One thing I can't understand is how saved people would allow queers to come around their children. They're molesters, and they're wicked, and they're the last people that you should allow around your children. It's, 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 you know, first of all, they're disgusting, and you don't want them around you at all, but definitely not around your children. Definitely not around your children. So look what it says in verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Now, this is a really interesting term. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they spoiled the Egyptians, and they, they basically, it says they borrowed stuff, but they were never going to give that stuff back. So it didn't really, <laughs> they borrowed it permanently, okay? So they, they spoiled the Egyptians when they went out, and it says they went out with a high hand. And basically what that means is, is kind of like an open rebellion. Like, yeah, we're, we're out of here. God set us free. And so, you know, I've, I've, I, when I think of high hands, I think of like, you know, maybe high five and everybody is like, yeah, woo, we're out of here, you know. But uh, it's, not, it's not definitely a proud thing, but it's like a victorious swagger or a confidence as they went out with a high hand. 
And, you know, I don't think Pharaoh liked that very much. And your sin doesn't like that very much. When you're confident, you're like, yeah, I'm saved. I'm going to walk a new path. I'm going to be, I'm going to live in my new man. And your sin nature doesn't like that. The devil doesn't like that. And he wants to try to put you back under the yoke of bondage. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse number 5. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 5. Actually, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm just going to read Revelation 21, 5. Revelation 21, 5 says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And isn't that great that once you get saved, that we have a new nature, we have a new man, there's a new, we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We have what's called the new man. Our spirit is made alive. And, you know, that's the spirit that, that cannot sin. You cannot, um, you know, that's, that new man cannot sin. But you know what? Your old man can the flesh that's inside you can, and that flesh is going to strive against your spirit until the day of Christ, it's, until the day you die. It's going to be a struggle. And, you know, they say the struggle is real. The struggle of sin is real. And if you dabble in it, and you mess with it, and you go back to the ones you've already conquered, then you know what? You're going to have a hard time in this Christian life, and we need to you know, follow after the things of the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit so we won't, be, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so look at John chapter 8, verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. See, we've been made free. Why would we need to go back to Egypt when we've been freed? Why? Why would we want that? Again, because the flesh wants to go back. The flesh lusts after things, and it, it's a, like I said, it's a struggle. It's, it's a struggle between your spiritual man and the, and the flesh. John 8, 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. See, what does whosoever mean again? It means anyone, doesn't it? So anybody that committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son, uh, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free... Ye shall be free indeed. See, when you got saved, you became free indeed. And so God makes all things new. Christ makes all things new, including our spirit. And we need to recognize the fact that once Christ has made us free, we're free indeed. Now go back to your text in Exodus chapter 14. Look at verse 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them. And the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and the horsemen and his army and overtook them and camping by the sea beside Pihiroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Um, so, the, so the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And this leads me to my next point and, and statement number three, which... Uh, it, which is when things get hard, don't be the complainer in the camp. See, things are going to get hard once you become a Christian. Yeah, all things are become new. Yay, I'm saved. It's great. And then things start getting hard. Then the devil comes after you. Then you're, you know, the world comes after you. And then, uh, then things start to get hard. You start to go through tribulation. You, th you start to go through persecution. It's not just... Uh, you know, the, the lust of the flesh that wants to go back, but it's also then you become hated of all men. The Bible says that we would be hated of all men. If they hated Christ, they're also going to hate you. So don't be a complainer in the camp when things get hard because, what, you know, nobody likes the camp complainer, right? Everybody, you know, people, when people go camping, you know, you've heard that term, uh, they're not a happy camper. Have you ever heard that term? 
so nobody likes the person that's at camp that's always complaining about it. It's too hot, it's too cold, you know, uh, there's not enough food, whatever it is that you're complaining about. The kids are too loud at night, I'm having a hard time sleeping, that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, when you're persecuted in the Bible, we're not supposed to necessarily complain about that. You might want to pray to God about that. But don't be the person that just instantly starts complaining. But this is what happens immediately when, in, in this chapter, look at what it says in verse 11. It says, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Yeah, Moses, that's exactly what, you know, what, what a dumb thing to say. But this is what happens. People start complaining about the leadership. People start complaining about Moses. Why'd you take us out here, Moses, just so he could die? I mean, how do you answer that question? As a pastor, sometimes people will start to complain about stuff, and you're just like, why are you complaining about this? It's so stupid. Um, it says, wherefore hast thou dealt with thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? As if Moses is the one that really saved him. It was God's the one that gave them this great victory. Moses was just the leader doing what God asked him to do, right? Look at verse 12. It says, is not, the, is, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. So these people are just like, we, didn't we tell you we didn't want to go? Didn't we tell you that we just wanted to stay and serve the Egyptians? But where are they right now? They're with Moses and the children of Israel, right? So we, this is what happens. People start to complain. People start to whine when they're getting uh, persecuted. And, you know, we need to be people that just stand in there and take the persecution. We need to be able to take that hour of temptation that comes upon us and not to sit there and complain to the pastor about it, not to sit there and complain uh, to God about it. Because ultimately, if you're complaining to the pastor about the way things are going, oh, I can't handle this persecution, it's too hard. I can't believe all these sodomites are surrounding our building right now and they're mad because of something that you preached. It's like, hey, we're preaching the word of God. Did, what did you sign up for? You know, there's a lot of different churches you can go to that you're not going to have sodomites surrounding your building because of something that your pastor preached. You know what? It's called a country club. It's called, hey, there's plenty of, there's churches on every corner down here. I'm, I'm from the Northwest. You know, it, we got to go a little ways before we find a church. But like down here, there's Baptist churches on every corner. And it, it's really just, it blows my mind about how many churches there are down here. And I just don't understand, you know, why would, you, why would you want to come to a church like a church like Pastor Burson's church or a, pa a church like my church or, pa or like Pastor Ed Williams or Pastor Roger Jimenez, Pastor Jonathan Shelley? Why would you want to come to a church like our church when you don't have to go through persecution? Just don't come to our church. Quit whining about it. You know, and obviously not, there's not a lot of whiners, but look at these whiners right here are in Scripture. You know, Moses had to deal with this garbage while they're trying to go out and serve God, and then you got the whiners are starting to come out. The whiners in the camp, they're complaining. Oh, just let us alone. We want to serve the Egyptians. Quit being weak. Yeah. Take the persecution. Hey, Job put, put up with a lot of affliction, didn't he? Yeah. Job put up with a lot of persecution. You know what? He came forth as gold. Yeah. And hey, we need, just need to learn that sometimes when we're going through persecution, that's the best place to be because God's going to make you better from that persecution. He's going to make you be able to stand in there when the times get even tougher than that. And you know what? There's a great tribulation that's coming upon this earth. There's a lot of, of worse things coming. And you know what? We might be the generation that has to go through that. We don't know. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff that's gone on in the last two years, hasn't there? And so we need to be prepared to go through persecution and affliction and take it like a champ and quit whining about everything. Quit whining about stuff at church that doesn't make a difference. Hey, we're trying to do something bigger and better for God. And you know what? Guess what? Your pastor is not perfect. Just so you know. They're not always going to make every decision 100% perfect either. And it really just amazes me that people would be like, oh, my pastor's so great, he's so good, you know, he does this, this. and then he does one thing you don't like, and you're whining about it. I'm ready to quit the church. You know, he didn't agree with me. Well, guess what? You know what? I'm not always going to agree with you. You're not always right. You ever thought about that? Maybe, I, maybe you're the one that's wrong. 
And so we need to take persecution and we need to be able to take hardship. And you know what? If the pastor didn't agree with you about something, that's not really that hard, is it? Why don't you just be quiet and maybe learn something? And hey, if he is wrong, well, pray for your pastor then. You know, sometimes your pastor is going to make mistakes. Maybe not every judgment he makes is going to be the 100% perfect judgment. Because guess what? We're not Jesus. Jesus is the only one that's going to make all the perfect decisions. You know, we try our best. We do our best. But, you know, some people just, it, it's, it, they're ready to just throw their pastor in the dumpster as soon as he does something that they don't like. And it's, it's weird. It's weird. It is wicked. And you shouldn't have that kind of attitude about it. So, you know, and people will think that it's easier to go be a servant in Egypt than it is to be free and serve Christ because of persecution. Isn't that true that that's why a lot of uh, Christians fall away from the faith? Because of persecution. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. And I'm going fast because I, I want to I wanna be done sometime tonight. So... I apologize, but if you don't have time to write it down or uh, go to it, just write it down or just listen. Matthew 13, 21 says, Yet hath not, yet, excuse me, ha, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. See, there's a lot of people that get saved, and then as soon as a little bit of tribulation or a little bit of persecution happens, they're ready to hit the road. They're ready to hit the road. And they're like, oh yeah, pastor, I'm going to stand with you no matter what. I'm going to stand with you till the tribulation comes. I'll be your right-hand man. And then as soon as some, you know, a couple sodomites show up to try to protest the church, they're ready to flee and run away. Well, I can't, you know, I can't lose my job, pastor. Well, hey, you better count the cost. If you're going to a, if you're going to a good church, you know what? You're going to get persecuted. If you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to get persecuted. And you know what? You should stand with your pastor, and you should stand with the man of God, and, and back him up. Because you know what? The, the last thing that I want to hear from one of my church members, if I'm going through persecution, is how come you, you know, pastor, how come you, didn't, how come you didn't do this, or how come you didn't do that? Yeah. Quit whining. Yeah. Quit being weak. Amen. Stand with the man of God. You know what we need is your prayers when we're going through stuff like that. You don't know what all is going on behind the scenes. You're worried about your job. Well, you should have thought about that before you joined a church that is, you know, demon slain and dragon hunting and ripping, on, ripping face on sin. Amen. Look, you don't have to go to this church. Right. You don't have to go to a church like ours. Right. But you should count the cost before you go to one because you know what you might think? Well, hey... You know, it all sounds fun. Yeah, woo, I'm in the new IP. Ooh, yeah. But then it's like, wait a minute, I could lose my job. Hey, go back to the old IP then. Go back to the Church of Christ or whatever church you went to before. Go to community church, you know, abundant life community church. Where, you, where the life is not really abundant. You know, you got a lot of, you got, you know, pizza parties and Chuck E. Cheese and kids classes and all kinds of stuff. But you know what you're not going to get? Good preaching. You're not going to get hard preaching. You're not going to do any good, good works for God. Because guess what? None of these churches go soul winning. They don't. You want to earn rewards? Go to a great church. But hey, if, if you get persecuted because of that, be willing to take it. And quit being weak and quit being a whiner and quit trying to quit. And nobody, wants, nobody likes a complainer when you're going through the, the heat of battle. That's the last thing as a pastor I want to hear, is somebody whining about something. Maybe you shouldn't have preached that, Pastor. You know, and we had some sodomites come to our church not too long ago, last September. And, you know, it was a light affliction. It was fun. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the only thing we did is just put an invitation on some queer's door. Oh, well, sorry for trying to get you saved. You little sissy. But that's, that's what happened. That's why we got persecuted. You know? Some pastors, you know, they, they preach the hardest sermon ever against Sodomites, so they got persecuted. <laughs> There's some pastors here. Some pastors have had, like, protesters at their, at their, church, ha uh, their church for, like, weeks and months in a, in a row. It, it happens. But look, don't be weak. Don't be a complainer. You, you signed up for it, Remember? So don't, uh, 
Don't just sit there and complain about stuff like that. You should get on the man of God's side and quit being a complainer. Turn to uh, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Look at verse 2. So this complainer camp kind of, you know, kind of took root. There was, you know, obviously in the, there was millions of people in this exodus. And not everybody was exactly zealous for God, you know. So look, at here's some more complaining that they complained to Moses. And the people cried unto Moses, verse 2, And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Actually, I'm sorry, Numbers verse uh, 11, verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. See, God's not pleased when people are complaining. God doesn't think it's, you know, he doesn't think it's good when you're complaining. It says, and the Lord heard it, and his what? Anger was kindled. So when God hears people whining, the people of God whining about stuff, you know what he doesn't? He, he doesn't think, it, oh, maybe I should just uh, baby these people. No, it, it makes them mad. His anger is kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. There's people in church that they're already on their way out the door. And you know where they're at? They're, they, first, they're here. They're like, yeah, pastor, I'm with you. I'm ready to go through persecution and tribulation. And then, you know, sooner, you know, as time goes by, they start, they start to get back towards the back of the church. And that's why we always say the, the back of the church is the backslidden row. In our church, it's the, the ones where the families with children are sitting. But anyway, some churches, they're just, they sit in the very back because they want to be the first ones out where nobody notices. They want to be the last ones in so that nobody notices. But you know what? We should not be a people that is going to be sitting in the backslidden row. And, you know, that, it angers God. So he, he consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. You know why? Because they, they didn't want to be part of the action. They wanted to be on the outskirts and, and not do the things, not, not serve the Lord like they should. Look at verse 2. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed... Unto the Lord the fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Taborah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? So what are they doing? They're complaining about the food that they have now. God's been providing everything for them. They're, they're in the wilderness. But God's still taking care of them, isn't he? But what do they want? They want their luxuries back that they had when they were in the world. Look what it says in verse 5. We remember the fish. We, we, we did eat in Egypt freely. Isn't that a funny choice of words that they use? They were bond servants in Egypt, and they're whining. And, but they're, when they're saying that they said that they ate in Egypt freely, they weren't free. Maybe they could freely eat fish, but they weren't free. The cucumbers and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And if you think about what the manna, what does the manna represent? You know, that God came down and was the bread of life. So what do they complain about? The manna that God gave them. See, sometimes Christians will get to this point where they don't care about Jesus anymore. They don't care that Jesus refreshes them morning by morning and feeds them bread, the bread of life out of the Word of God. They, just, they don't care about the Word of God anymore. They just care about the things that they used to get in the world. They care about the melons and the leeks and the garlic, which basically represent the worldly things that your soul lusts after. They fell a lusting, didn't they? Yeah. This manna represents Jesus coming down from heaven and feeding us spiritually every morning. And the children of Israel despised it, didn't they? And as Christians, we should never get to the point where we despise the things of God, where we despise the Word of God. I don't want to read this Word of God. I don't need this in the morning. I want the other stuff that I used to have in Egypt when I was freely eating it. But you know what? That comes with a price. That going back to Egypt comes with a price. And the price is your destruction. So, don't think food and luxuries that you used to have in this world are better than the things that God can provide for you. Because guess what we get? We get a life that never ends. 
We get a life in heaven and we don't even know what those things are. It's kind of a big surprise. But we do know there's streets of gold and we know there's, you know, the new Jerusalem that's going to come down and that we get, you know, but nothing is really explained in detail too much in heaven about what we're going to get. You know why? Because I think it's a surprise. I think it's going to be a lot of great things. Now, obviously, he gives us some clues, but you know what? It's going to be far better than this world. Amen. You're not going to, there's no going to be, not going to be any masks in heaven, just so you know. <laughs> Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Christians are not supposed to love the world. We're not supposed to love the things that are in the world. If any man love the, the world, and, and it's not talking about loving people. It's talking about the things that the world would provide, the things that Egypt was providing for them that they're so waxing wanton against Christ for. You know, those are not things that we're supposed to love. God wants us to love him and the things of God. In uh, Hebrews chapter, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. See, Moses, he had all the luxuries of Egypt, but you know what? He didn't care about those things. That bee was bigger than me. Anyway, uh, look at what, what it says in verse 24, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. I keep losing my place on this thing. Sorry. I keep touching buttons and it keeps going back to the top of the page. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, sometimes we're supposed to suffer affliction. And, you know, is that, you know, it's easier to go back to your sin. Yeah. It's easier to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Look, sin is pleasurable. Otherwise, our flesh wouldn't want to do it. But so, what are we supposed to do? Go back to Egypt? We've been, we've been given something better, and we should serve the Lord with gladness and not worry about the things of this world. Look, it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of of the reward. Moses knew that if he just forsook the pleasures of sin for a season, that he had something better waiting for him later on down the road. And that's the mentality that we should have as Christians instead of wanting to go back to Egypt. Statement number four, God will fight for you when you separate from the world. Let's look back in our text at Exodus chapter 14. God will fight for you when you separate from the world. And we should be separate from the world. Not only when we leave Egypt, we should leave with the mindset of we're going forward to serve Christ, but, and also he's going to protect us when we go through tribulation and affliction. He's going to ultimately bless us for those things. But um, it says that, you know, well, God will fight for us when we separate from the world. See, you can't just be in the world, be of the world, and expect that God's just going to bless your life for that. He's not going to. But if you will separate from the world, then God will bless you for that, and he will take care of you. Look at verse 13 in Exodus 14. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and he shall hold your peace. Which means you're going to shut your mouth now. You know, these people that were complaining, you know, God, they'll see the salvation of the Lord too. But, you know, obviously, um, God, God wants us to separate. He wants us to separate from the world. Look what it says in verse uh, 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it. For the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea, and I behold... I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon the host, and upon his chariots, and upon the horsemen, 
And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord, which went out before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these. So that one came not near to the other all the night. See, there's a division between the camps that God put there, and God wants us to have a division between our camp. He wants the people of God to be on one side and the world on the other. We're not supposed to uh, mingle with the world and the things of the world. He wants there to be a division. And so there should be a division of our camps, the world's camp and our camp. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are, it, you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. See, God wants us to not touch the unclean thing. He does not want us to go back to the world. He does not want us to go back to Egypt. He wants us to touch not the unclean thing. He wants us to separate from wickedness and worldliness. And so, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 23, it says, And the Egyptians pursued and went after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and horsemen. See, uh, they, they came hard after him. And, and I'm just going to skip down to verse uh, number 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. And when the morning appeared, the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. And all the hosts of Pharaoh came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. So God destroyed the, the, uh, the, the Egyptians who were pursuing after them. And because there was that separation between them, God did not allow the Egyptians to come near uh, the children of Israel. But see, when we separate, that's going to be the same thing that God does for us. He's going to keep the world away from us. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to destroy our enemies when they come against us. But we have to be separate. We can't just mingle in the world. We can't be double-minded. We can't just, uh, you know, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So we can't be that person that's double-minded and you're in church on Sunday and then you're in the bar on Monday. We can't do that. That's not going to, God's not going to protect us. He's not going to give us victory over our enemies. And uh, so you know, God did a great thing where he destroyed the armies of, of the Egyptians and uh, it's, a, it's just a great picture of what God will do for us if we live a separated life also. So um, just to wrap things up here, you know, if you're not free, you need to get free. You need to get saved. And in a group this size, there's going to be people that aren't saved. But let me tell you this. Jesus Christ will make you free. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. Amen. So if you're not free, you need to get free. If you are free, you need to stay free and, you know, don't quit. Don't go back to the world. If you're free, stay free and don't quit. So if you're going through persecution and affliction, endure hardness as a good soldier. Don't be a whiner or complainer. And when we do that, God will give us the victory. And so men, be men. Be what God made you to be. Don't. You know, don't be a sissy. Yeah. Don't be a loser that can't hold a job down. Take care of your family. Amen. Men, work hard. Amen. And women, you know, obviously an application for you would be to be what God made you to be too. Don't go back into the world and try to, you know, I can't wait to go back and work in my professional job. You know what, what the world needs is mothers that will take care of their children. Yeah. Right. You know what the world needs? It needs mothers that will be uh, obedient wives to their husbands. We got too much feminism in this world, right. you know, and we got too many sissy men in this world. Right. We need men to be men and women to be women and you to accept your role. You know, you got saved out of that. 
You, got, you should have a different mentality now than you used to have. You know what? People just, just want to go back to Egypt. Why? So some other man can tell you what to do? Is that what you want? They can put you in a pair of pants and, 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 then, they can, and then they can tell you what to do? You, won't, you don't want to obey your husband or listen to your husband, but you'll obey some total stranger that doesn't even like you. I don't understand that. I don't understand why men would want to be a stay-at-home dad. It's just, look, you know what's going to end up happening? You're going to get divorced. You know, nobody wants a, no, no, no real wife wants a stay-at-home husband where she goes out and works outside the home. I mean, maybe there's some weird women out there that like that, but ultimately every person, every man I've ever known that said, I'm a stay-at-home dad, end up getting divorced. <laughs> or their, their girlfriend or wife left them. We need to be what God made us to be. And not go back to the roles that the world was signs for us. You know what the world wants to do? They want to put men in skinny jeans. That's what they want to do. They want to put men in skinny jeans and pink shirts. And pink ties. And they want pastors to stand up at their bar stools. And, you know, hey, pastors, we need to be men and show the world what real manly pastors are like. And we need to preach the word of God without apologizing about it. And without... Oh, I'm really sorry that I offended you. No, we, the word of God shouldn't offend anybody. Great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. So, and then again, the application to children, serve the Lord. Your parents can't serve the Lord for you. You have to serve the Lord on your own. You have to make the decision. Look, we're not Calvinists here. I hope nobody's Calvinist here. See, kids, you have to make your own decision to be saved, and you have to have your own walk and your own path in life. And look, don't be that person, you know, that, that is a pain in the neck to your pastor. When Moses, after the people of the children of Israel complained, Moses ended up saying, just kill me. Just kill me. I mean, Moses is probably one of the greatest men in the whole Bible, and he's got a, a complaining bunch of people that, uh, you know, that are making him want to kill himself or will have God kill him. You know, we don't want to put our pastors in that position where you're just like, hey, God, just kill me. I mean, <laughs> I want to live. <laughs> don't be a pain in my neck. Don't be a pain in your pastor's neck. You know, don't, you don't want to get into that situation where you're making your pastor want to quit. Because, look, there's a very big dearth in the land of pastors that actually get up and preach the word of God. You should be thankful that you have one. And again, they're not perfect. None of us are perfect as pastors, but you know what? We're, we try to do our best. And so you should stand behind your pastor and be good to them. Now, Romans chapter 6, verse... Actually, I'm just going to have you go to Romans chapter 12. And I'll end here. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, what's it say? Reasonable service. Hey, our reasonable service is to serve God who freed us from Egypt. He freed us from that worldly life. And that's what God says. And we're not supposed to be, look, verse 2, be not conformed to this world. See, we're not supposed to be conformed. He saved us out of this world. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what that excuse me, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to know what's good and acceptable and perfect, that perfect will of God, that you're not conformed to this world. Don't go back to Egypt. It's not it's got nothing good for you there. There's nothing good for you in the world besides heartache and pain. You go back to those things. You're, going, you're like a hog going back to the pig pen. The, the hog that just got cleaned up, you're going back to the hog pen. It's like the, the, the drunkard that went to puke, you go back and, and, and to that puke. Nobody want, you don't really want that. See, your flesh wants it. But see, if you feed your spirit more than you feed your flesh, then you're going to be doing a good thing. So do you want to be free from the yoke of bondage and sin? Use your freedom to serve Jesus Christ all the days of your life instead. That's what you need to do. And I'll just read this last scripture. I know I just had you turn to that last one, but I'm going to read this last scripture and I'm done. Hebrews 10 38 says, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no 
pleasure in him. Doesn't mean you're not saved anymore. It just means he will have no pleasure in you. You don't want to be that person that draws back. And it says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Do you want God to have pleasure in you? Then serve him all the days of your life. And don't look back. It says, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hey, if you're saved today, don't draw back unto perdition. Don't draw back, because you know what? You want God, do you want God to have pleasure in you? I'm sure everybody in this, this group wants God to have pleasure in them. So don't draw back. Don't try to go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the world. Look, it's not better than being a Christian. People just forget. People forget what it was like. But you know what? You need to... Put yourself in remembrance of these things and not draw back unto perdition. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much uh, for this group of people, Lord. I pray, Lord, you'd help us all, every single person that's here right now, Lord, to just continue to serve Christ all the days of their life. And, Lord, I, I pray that for all these children, Lord, that they would uh, find the things of God something that's a good thing to, to keep and serve. And, Lord, I pray... If there's anybody here that's not saved, Lord, that somebody uh, would put their trust in Christ uh, tonight or during this camp uh, through, through Saturday, Lord. Just pray, Lord, that the Word of God would have free course for the rest of this uh, camp. And to pray for the pastors that are coming, uh, that you'd give them great messages to put, on our, uh, put in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.